Merci beaucoup, mesdames, messieurs. Et, um, je suis très heureuse d'être ici um, aujourd'hui et présenter notre résultat et um, le travail um, de Forgain. Et, um, mais alors, je um, voudrais m'excuser, moi, parce que je ne peux pas parler français très bien. Et alors, um, Georges euh, a besoin de traduire. Et um, je vais parler anglais. Je suis désolée. Bah. Alors, c'est moi, Nicole von Womschwag. And um, first of all, I'd like to introduce ourselves, um, like Forging, the team of Forging, to you, so you know who we are. Exactly. So we are three res researchers in Hamburg, and we do have a very strong background in forensic uh, and um, legal medicine and in forensic genetic trace analysis. Uh, um, so we do have um, more than 20 years of experience at university institutes, and so that means we know what we are doing, and we are, um, work for most of the times in leading positions. So we also did um, many, many research studies on um, population genetics, on kinship analysis, such as paternity an um, investigations, and we focus on the complications in evaluation of those questions. So we were very keen to um, do the best possible investigations. So uh, we start with the kinship analysis, like. Uh, investigation relationships between p um, people, like, such as paternity testing, um, complicated cases, and family reunion. As I said, we did a lot of research, and just to show you that that's true what I'm telling you. And just uh, to um, show you this, um, to explain you later why it's difficult when working with animals, this is a study we did showing that it's very, very difficult to find out who's the father of a kid when the putative fathers are related. That's very difficult and you can easily include the wrong uh, man. So you can just mean you say the uncle is the father of the kid even though it's only the uncle. So it's just another one. It's even more complicated and just to show you that, that we did a lot of background research. Mm -hmm. So we also um, developed new methods for the forensic case work. We optimized them and we tested methods on um, difficult conditions. So for example, we were the first introducing the method of real-time PCR, which is a very, very well-used method by now, but we were the first who developed it. It's just for you, I think, to, to s uh, tell you that we did many research studies to optimize the existing methods. Mm. So this is an example for um, trying to investigate bad samples, in this case from burned humans, and, and so then you have only little OM left and you have to investigate like burned remains, and this is a study on that. Mm. And the same also study on um, petrified bodies, so when the tissue degrades because it's getting old, and then everything, the DNA, just gets um, degraded and it's really difficult to investigate. And this is, um, again, something we um, uh, investigated in our studies. So um, then there is an issue that is contamination in genetic casework. And you, when you have DNA from bad samples, you really have to be certain that you don't uh, have a contamination problem. That's why we did also research on this subject. Um, that's, uh, this is such one, another example. In this study, we tried to get rid of unwanted DNA. We tested everything and found out that there's only little you can really do when you have contaminated samples. And that's important to know when you work with such difficult samples we deal here in the case of the, sheeps and the sheep and the wolves. And also another issue, even with your instru the instruments you do have, such as scissor or a knife, you can easily contaminate, uh, the bring the DNA from one case, from one trace to another, and you have to be aware of this to um, really get uh, perfect uh, and good results. So our focus, as I told you, is kinship analysis. Also trace analysis, such um, as I told you, 
tiny amounts of DNA from, for example, single hairs from bone fragments or um, other tiny samples. And the third part of our focus is the animal genetics. That's why I'm here today. So we started with a um, research proze project and established um, genetic assays, just as we already did for the human beings, for animals of forensic interest. So we thought about Bo what's an animal of forensic interest, and we came up with those uh, fellows no. here. So, um, so that's why are we here with the dogs. We picked the dog because it's a pe popular pet in almost every country, and it has a really close contact to the human beings. And um, so we can do kinship analysis for breeders, but also trace analysis, like real forensic medicine. And here you see a self-made stick for hitting, and it turns out that somebody slaughtered his dog using this stick. So what we did, we found tiny little spots here from dog, the dog's blood. You can't uh, see the spots with your normal eyes. And so we could link the, uh, the stick to uh, the um, suspect. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, so the um, pretty easy question is always who did it. We analyzed bite marks to check which dog might have bitten um, the little uh, boy. And mostly it turned out it's a family dog, not the fighting uh, dog. No, no. But it's always the same question, it's just in the forensic case, who did it, who, um, to whom belongs the twig. Class. And unfortunately it's not always as easy as you can see in this case. Yes. That's a bite mark. Here yeah. you don't need DNA because you know it was this one. So that's easy, that's nothing for DNA. Okay, so we come to the dog. Dogs uh, belong to the um, Canis lupus fam um, family, and there you do have the wolf, the coyote, the jackal, the white dog, the fox, this one here, and even though you won't believe it by looking at the other to the family, look at that, and you can easily find the similarities now to wolf and jackal. It looks much more similar. So, and the scientific background of our research was a doctoral thesis. And we sampled um, about um, 800 dogs um, coming from more than 100 different races and also from some mixtures, some yep. mixtures we know and some we didn't. We detected the specific genetic profile, did population statistics and built our own database. And then, then we set up different uh, groups within the dogs and also we analyzed uh, a couple of wolves, about 80 wolves, and also fox. So yeah, that's how we did it, also with the swaps, just like by, um, with the human beings. So, oops. And the sample origin for the study was very important because um, it's absolutely necessary that you can trust the source of your animal. So that's um, our pure dogs, uh, pure races, came from breeders. Also some from friends or colleagues we really could trust. This was yeah, important yeah, yeah. for us. Um, the fox came from local hunters. <laughs> and uh, we also got some da um, data from scientific uh, databases. The wolf came from zoos all over Germany and some also from Austria and also from Swiss. We did um, get some. And we also got some uh, wolves from trustful researchers who told us, okay, these are for sure um, pure wolves, such a, like the gray wolf. Exactly, so they, yeah, exactly, they came from Russia and the Baltic origin. As I told you, gray wolves and also some other kind of wolves are now in our database. Okay. Yeah. This is what we did. These are the markers we investigate. We choose 10 mark uh, genetic markers, so-called STRs, short tandem repeat markers. And uh, because the STRs are highly polymorphic. And we used um, those markers also because they are very common in human forensic genetics. And so we have a lot of, um, of experience with this technique. And they are very good and very easy to detect. And they are highly sensitive. That means you can get signals from very small amounts of uh, material. So this is how it looks like when we type one of our dogs. So um, you can see here um, the SDR data, the 10 different uh, markers. 
and the specific signals from this individual, like these little peaks here. So, and then the question, why do we only investigate 10 markers? So when we look at our database and in the literature, it turns out that using these 10 markers, we do have a power of discrimination from one in at least 10 millions. That means only one individual under 10 millions would have this genetic pattern. <laughs> so that's totally sufficient for our purpose when the question comes, who did it, to whom belongs this blood or the saliva. It turns out that we can, by using these 10 markers, we can discriminate between the canine groups. So what we do then, when we do have this genetic pattern, we do a, an association analysis, and there, behind that is a mathematical um, model, and this is something that um, do many, many other researchers also. So it's a well-known procedure, what we picked here. So how does it work? Just very oh shortly. And so first, we determine the genetic pattern for the different groups. And for example, like uh, the races, the duck sound and poodle group, or also even a dog group, wolf group, or the fox. So then, we uh, computer program checks for similarities and for differences. And then we do the statistical analysis, and we determine the frequencies of the different markers. So the second step then is we put in a DNA sample from an unknown animal and check what the computer tells us. Comparing. So and then the computer compares this mark, uh, model to the other specific different groups and we hopefully find out to which group our sample belong. So <coughs> and when we type a dog now, for example, I already showed you this picture, typical for a dog. Here you see as I told you before, the different markers and this here in circles are the typical, is a typical range for the signals from a dog. Here's a typical range and so on for every single. Mm. Uh, for example, this um, signal right here is the most common signal. Almost 50% of dogs do have this specific signal in this locus. And now, just imagine you type a, fo a fox and not a, ch uh, a dog anymore. Uh, now you see that here's a typical range I told you, and suddenly the signals are right here, without, uh, not within the range. So they look, uh, the uh, pattern looks kind of strange. So you even just at looking, you can see it's not a typical dog. It actually can't be a dog. It looks like a, a fox. So um. and typing a wolf is a little more difficult. Just the watch uh, this picture here. That's from a wolf because you see here you do have the signals within the regular ranges. So Vous for the first le... glance, nothing surprising. But here, in this case, we do have a signal that's only common present in our wolves and in none of our dogs. So that's how it works. And so sticking with this signal, I told you about 92 base pairs on length. There's also another little longer, another signal, and these are kind of wolf-specific signals. So um, this is also s uh, something also other working groups describe that they find wolf-specific um, signals. And in our database, almost 70% of our so-called Russian wolves display this small signal. Okay. And 60% yeah. and of our uh, Baltic wolves, um, they display the slightly bigger allele. None of our timber wolves shows these signals. None of our wolves from zoos um, display the small signal. But surprisingly, when we got samples from France, we found um, the small 92 base pair fragment very often in samples from France. Uh, and again, that you believe me, as I told you before, there are others finding also wolf-specific signals. This is um, a forensic working group. Um, that's why I picked uh, those um, colleagues of mine. And they also, they did also different markers, but they found markers that are specific only for the wolf. Some are together here, wolf and dog, but you see se uh, several um, signals were only present in wolves. Um, I should like to show you an example, a um, summary of ours. So this is a, the locus, uh, one of the loci we investigate. You see here 
In blue, signals we found by our, um, in our wolf group, and in orange, signals we found um, from our shepherds, so wolves, shepherds. And you see, again, similar, some signals, the smaller ones were only by the wolves, and also the larger ones, and here you find something from wolf and dog. So again, the same result. The length, the length of the fragment, the length uh, of the DNA fragment. And uh, the, the fragment length depends on the de la short, a number of short tunnel repeats you do have. And this is the polymorphic, the difference you do have. Okay, and um, when we summarize all of our results, we found that here, when we look at our 800 dogs coming from 100, uh, more than 100 races, Pre we oui. also find simi uh, genetic similarities to the wolves, of course, because, uh, because they are related. Exactly. And so um, the, the numbers were between 3 and 35 percent similarity to the typical wolf pattern. So, and we do have four races which are very similar, which uh, displays the higher similarities to the wolf. And uh, um, that's why we said this is our range. Up to 35% can be a dog, and higher um, values point to something different. So, and um, how does it look when we do use our database? In this case, we were lucky and we got an animal with, which was a known mix of a wolf and a shepherd dog. Yeah. Uh -huh. And as you can see, the program tells us that this um, dog, uh, individual has a very high similarity to our Belgian shepherds. And um, the second hit from the program is the wolf with 45%, so more than the 35% uh, I told you in the beginning. Mm -hmm. So that's how, uh, how it works. Mm -hmm. And we also found these um, 92 base pair Donc. allele. And um, so these 10 markers are pretty good for determining the race um, differences. For example, this is one uh, locus and you see the um, frequencies of the different um, alleles for this lo um, locus. No, this is, uh, these are uh, the pooled data from our 800 dogs in our database. And when we just look at two different races, for example, the beagle, you will see that the beagle, the beagle does have this signal the most, only uh, almost a, uh, more than 80% of our beagles do have this signal, like 179. Donc. And on the other side, you see a German hunting dog, and this dog looks almost the opposite. So yes. this is what makes the differences. So that means uh, we can show good differences between the different races. And for example, when we have a dog like this, so a purebred French bulldog, and we put it in our database, it, turn, it comes up as a highly uh, pure French bulldog. And we also tested the method on known dog mixes, such as Nanook, you see our object here, um, a golden retriever and a Weimar runner, and it was easily distinguishable with our database method. And you can also, when we try this on more, uh, a more difficult subject, such as people, people comes from Hungary, so our method will say, um, tell you that people is um, probably a mix from uh, this dog, the Stafford Terrier, the Beagle, and Jack Russell. And when you put them all together and mix it, it might really be true. So it's also possible with other dogs, just to show you um, how it really works. So it's also possible maybe from coming from the United States. Sabia. And here you see the different races found in Navy. No. And you also see Navy has only 14% similarity to the wolf-specific genetic pattern. Uh, so, um, sometimes we get the questions, are 10 markers enough? Why only 10 markers? Delicious. People tend to say, the more the better. This is what I always learned. This is really true. Mm. So, um, this is always better, and I really can tell you, no, it's not. So, um, and also, in this case, I bring you an example from the forensic human studies. Because there you um, have uh, many um, studies trying to determine the phenotype, like hair, eye, and skin color. 
And we should show in our own study, in a very thorough study, and for more than 400 individuals, that um, we can predict the colors when, with only using six genetic markers, even though other studies show you must uh, use uh, for sure 20 markers or 40 markers. And we could show just by picking the best of those markers that six are totally enough to get the same results. And that's why, uh, because, that's just imagine when you do have two really, really good markers predicting maybe blue eyes. And when you see the two markers, you have a good chance that uh, the individual has blue eyes and then you add a third marker, a third bad marker, the whole assay will just drop down and will get worse. So just that you believe me that we really did this and published this in a very good scientific Don't journal. Go. And that's why we are here today, because people came to us and say, when you investigate bite markers, can you investigate also um, bite marks from our dead animals? Wow. And that's, of course, we said, why not? And this is actually also a kind of murder case. So we uh, got the samples to investigate. So, um, and that's why you um, have very often not full profiles, on, um, but only part uh, or partly genetic profiles, like incomplete. But in, in many cases, uh, it uh, didn't matter anything because as soon as you get some specific uh, canine-specific signals, you can always say, for sure you did find the DNA from a dog, from a wolf, or a fox. Uh. So what we did, we got the samples, we uh, worked on them, we determined the genetic pattern and performed an association mm -hmm. analysis. And this is an example what can uh, be the result. One case, we found first hit canis lupus, more than 70%, second hit also the wolf, and the third hit also. So it's easy, exactly. And on the other hand, what's also easy is um, the case number four. We found Labrador, a Malinois, another dog, and just 15% of, of a wolf. So we could tell this is probably a dog, maybe a mix of the races I told you. So coming to the problem, two cases like here, we have almost half-half, like wolf and German shepherd. And then it comes uh, to the moment when we do have uh, the need to think about it. So it's no dog, it's no wolf, uh, as it looks like. So we, I was, what can you do? It's not a wolf, it's not a dog. So you have to think about your results. What can it be? How can you explain your results? Don't. And first is that um, we are, know that none of our dogs, none of our 800 dogs in our database looks like the results I showed you. And all, on the other side, none of our wolves in our database look like the results yeah, I showed you. So then comes, uh, we come to the forensic approach. So we have to explain our data and we truly have to think about what really uh, makes sense in this case. As now, as far as we are now, we only can say it's not a dog, it's not a wolf compared to our data. So the, most, the first question in mind is for sure, can it be a mixture? So first is, you have to think about is it even possible that they made? Can a dog and a wolf make little puppies. So this is a yes, it, it works. They can do that, we know this. Another question is, is it technically possible that a dog made, uh, made a, a wolf? So do they live somewhere together? Can they meet each other? And so, yeah, why Ask not? Uh, they can. And also, um, then you have to think, okay, it, it's technically possible, it's also in, in practice, possible, uh, is this, um, has anybody seen the do a dog or a wolf? So can this be really true? Are there dogs in the neighborhood? For, um, and this is something where you have to say, yeah, why not? It can all, uh, it could easily be like that. So in summarizing this, you uh, we come up with the um, conclusion. Is there any good reason why this shouldn't be a mixture? Looking at our questions before, and we say, no, it's not a good reason. So it might be, uh, the DNA might come from a hybrid indeed. So, come to the questions and problems. Um, when we uh, did the investigation, we had uh, for uh, um, our French friends, we found several cases with those inconclusive results. And um, the question came up, why are there differences 
um, uh, different results from de when detecting hybrids. So first, um, that, uh, detecting hybrids or, um, depends highly on the markers you use. And uh, when the markers are not suitable for that, when they are not polymorphic enough, you won't find any hybrids. Just another example from the human uh, field. You see here so people from Germany and from different regions of Africa. And you see clearly that there are differences. So this would be a good marker. This is a marker you can use to distinguish. But when you use different markers without those differences, you have a bad assay and um, you, you weaken your assay, and that means you can, by choosing the markers in your assay, you can really influence the results at the end. Second is the database you use, um, which can lead to differences. So the computer can only tell you uh, what, uh, can only do what you tell him. So the quality of your input is absolutely crucial. crucial. Just imagine you do have a group in your database, a group of duck sounds, and you put it in um, the program, a sample from a duck sound as unknown, and it will turns out as a duck sound. But if you write in your program, in your database, by mistake, for example, it's a puck, so then the computer will, you it will tell you that this little fellow is a puck and not a duck sound. So that's important. So that means, what I try to tell you is that the database is absolutely important for the outcome. And when you compare two different labs, you can't get 100% identical results because they do have different databases and different methods. And it's also important when races that are not in the database cannot be found. And therefore, when you do have results, you really have to interpret them very thoroughly and carefully. So another question people like, ask, uh, like to ask is, why don't you use mitochondrial DNA? All the other labs do use mitochondrial DNA, why don't you do that? So mitochondrial DNA is another kind of DNA in the cell, and it's a very great for a forensic purpose, because it's um, located in the mitochondria, these little things here, and it comes in more than thousands of copies per cell. That means from tiny amounts of material, you can do a mitochondrial DNA analysis. And so come back to like bad samples such as hair, feces, or old bones. It's perfect to investigate when you use mitochondrial DNA. So but why then don't we do that? That's the question. So why, why don't, we do, don't we do that with the dark wolf well, DNA? So and that's the reason why we don't do that. When you see here the nuclear DNA, the auto, uh, where the SDRs come from, you do have the recombination. That means you have a mixture from the mother and the father in your child. Yeah. And that exactly. And that means that in the offsprings you always find something from uh, the relatives, from the ancestors. That's Don't. important for our um, analysis. Oh. Uh, mitochondrial DNA, on the other hand, has a maternal um, line. So it means mitochondrial DNA only goes from the mother to the offspring. Yeah. And that means when you do have, for example, a female wolf meeting a dog and you do get little puppies, this Age. one for example, and you investigate the mitochondrial DNA now, you will come up with a pure, uh, pure wolf because Donk. this one has the DNA, the mitochondrial DNA from the mother. Mm. And even when this a mixture, so it's a mixture for sure because of the parents. When this uh, mixed uh, wolf dog meets another dog and they have little puppies, you always uh, can only say it's on the mitochondrial mm. DNA way, it's f uh, um, a wolf. Hello, yeah. And the last point, a big point in question is uh, about the number of individuals we detect by doing our SDR analysis. There uh, might be some surprises or some dif uh, differences, and I try to explain why this can happen. So exactly, why do we find more individuals? And as I told you in the beginning, the genetic pattern is usually individual when it's polymorphic enough, so when the markers are good enough. Exception are monozygotic twins. And this is an example of different uh, results we got from some traces. 
And here in sample number one, you see the different alleles for every locus. And you see here in the sample two, there are different alleles compared to sample number one. Doppler. Very easy to say now, here we do have samples from two different individuals. Avec. And now regarding the sample number three, and you see it's identical to individual number one. And um, here you only have a couple of markers and they are also identical to sample number one. So most people would say now, looking at these data, we do have here four samples coming from two different individuals. The but. But why don't I, uh, do not, do I don't say this? Because the number of individuals detected is when, um, only valid when you know for sure that all individuals in this region are unrelated. So that's absolutely important. You have the power to um, discriminate genetic patterns from each other. And you can say this genetic pattern, what I told you in the beginning, has only one dog or one wolf out of 10 millions. D. Because relatives are genetically very similar. They can Le have parenté. many, many identical markers. So, and when we do this, for example, in forensic casework, we only do our analysis under the conditions that the people are unrelated. This is important, otherwise you can't really do this as I told you. Now coming back to our walls, when I do have the signals, like four alleles identical to uh, uh, another genetic patterns, who can really uh, know how many animals live close by in the specific region and how unrelated are the uh, wolves within a group, within a pack? So this is, should, is something you actually should know. For example, coming to my table, Maybe this is the sample, the genetic pattern, number one I to showed you on my table, and the other dog has almost the same genetic markers. This can be when they are brothers, for example. And um, coming um, to the, and also to the numbers, um, as I told you, just to, to strengthen, to, to show you my point, for the last 30 years, human researchers did nothing in forensic genetics but studying human forensic genetics. And um, today, we cannot say, clearly say, yes, that's your half-brother, that's for your brother for sure, when we not, not know everything around it. And we, we made, a, in, with, uh, in the last 30 years, a huge effort to create databases with thousands of human beings which are unrelated, which come from specific different um, population groups, and we still do have problems. I and so. so coming back to our wolves again, how will you really be sure that the wolves in your database or the wolves in your region where you do investigations are really unrelated? That's, uh, I think it just simply doesn't work. Or just not. because you can't, can't ask them or they won't answer you. Yes. Another problem when counting um, individuals, it might be mitochondrial DNA, when doing mitochondrial DNA, um, which um, you can't really get a um, clue to the number. You can't really come up with a number of individuals. So because of the maternal line means all um, relatives coming from one mother do have the same mitochondrial DNA, so they all look alike. You won't, you cannot count Donc the different si individuals. And um, the last, uh, what about the relationship? I already told you this. Actually, paternity testing is really easy, but again, it's only possible when you are sure that the people involved are unrelated. Otherwise, it won't work. Donc Same with uh, the ship, ship. That means when you really want to answer the questions people gave us, you should uh, talk to the wolf and tell him these questions. Where do you come from? How is your relation to the other investigated wolf? Uh, what are the possible scenarios concerning your rela relationship? This is something the wolf should answer. So this is just a, one of our last papers saying that today it's totally difficult to determine half-siblings or siblings without the parents. And so just imagine how difficult it is when you work with animals. Summary for all that is our forensic concept. We are honest. This is important because we work for the court, for the lawyers. And we, we stick with our results and we try to explain them. 
and yeah. we do not have any bias. That's totally important. So we we uh, we are very um, certain about that we work very in a very neutral, objective way. And that means that we are absolutely not interest, inter, interested in the overall results. This might so, uh, uh, sound uh, strange, but um, it's important for our work as forensic uh, researchers. And that's a, um, just an, another example. We don't care about the outcome, like hybrid or not, as long as we are very certain about our data. Just imagine our normal work is we investigate murder cases. And it's, um, you know, we must be uh, really, really neutral. We cannot think, oh, the pure uh, murdered girl. So we have to check in a murder case, is DNA detectable? Can it be linked to the suspect? Can it be linked to the victim? Um, or can we exclude the um, suspect, maybe? So we don't care about the outcome. It's don't. That is totally necessary. And even though when we do get something to investigate, we work for our client, client be of course, because he pays for us, he told us to investigate this, but we are absolutely only committed to the results of our data. And that's important mm -hmm. for you Donc to know. Uh yeah. Alors, finally, you survived. Merci beaucoup pour écouter. <laughs>